I'll be your moderator for the day proceedings. The Ministry of Labor, Social Partnership, Relations and Social the Partners, the Small Business Association, the Barbados Employees Conference, Cont Federation, and the Barbados Workers Union welcome you to our webinar, to mark worthy of our safety and health at work 2021. Today, our webinar topic of discussion will be revamping our safety practices to enable business continuity. Our focus audience is the retail sector. However, the information will be useful to general audiences. Housekeeping matters. Uh, please keep your mics muted to avoid background distractions. Questions will, will, which are submitted to this in the chat will be answered during the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. We are asking you to participate in our evaluation exercise at the end of the webinar. All right, so we will go straight into our presenter. Uh, Harold Oxley will be our president for the morning. Um, Mr. Oxley is no stranger to the health and safety in Barbados. Uh, Mr. Oxley is an occupational safety and health and hygiene professional with over 36 years of experience in the field and is currently the managing director and senior consultant of REA and Barrier Health International. Harold has been intimately involved in the drafting of the safety and health at work at 2005 and other legislation. In 2007, he and his company received the Small Business Association Scotia Bank Entrepreneur of the Year Award, as well as the Outstanding Performance in General Services Award. Similarly, in 2010, under his continuing leadership, the company won the Small Business Association Scotia Bank Professional Service Sector Award. He has previously functioned as the Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization, Temporary Technical Advisor to the Government of Guyana and also on behalf of the International Labour Organization as an external collaborator to the government of Antigua. He has formerly been a long-serving member of the National Advisory Committee on Occupational Health and Occupational Safety and Health, NACOSH, which acts as an advisory body to the Ministry of Labour, Barbados, as well as serve as the chairman of the Indoor Air Quality Standard Technical Committee convened by the National Standard Institute, BNSI. Harold is the charter member of the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health within the, U within the UK. So now I will re present, hand you over to Mr. Oxley. Good morning, sir. Hi, good morning Thank to you. you. Well, the web is yours. Beautiful. I will now switch to my um, screen. I will share my screen so that we can all see what we are doing. Okay. So welcome to this seminar. And the World Day for Safety and Health at Work, as you well know, that would have been yesterday officially, but because of our National Heroes Day, we are doing our presentation um, today. I will want to thank the Labor Department, the Ministry of Labor, um, NAPOSH, the Barbados Employees Confederation, the Barbados Workers Union, Small Business Association, and all persons for the invitation to make this um, presentation. I especially want to single out the Small Business Association because at a previous occasion, um, they would have been instrumental in sponsoring or facilitating me to go to a business continuity forum in Jamaica. So that has put me in a much better position to speak to the topic. Now you would have seen the topic which is being um, pushed by the ILO, the World Day for Safety and Health at Work 2021, and their theme is anticipate, prepare, and respond to crises invest now in resilient occupational safety and health systems, anticipate, prepare, and respond to crises. Here in Barbados, we have chosen a subtopic of revamping our safety practices to enable business continuity. So at the front, I want to see and um, make a little shift in that focus. You recognize that our focus is on the business continuity because you would have recognized that within the pandemic situation, uh, many companies found themselves scrambling, as we say in Barbados, uh, many of them were panicking. Um, some of them had a chance to test the, the systems. Um, some of those systems passed, some failed miserably. And in terms of uh, terminology, I want us to understand that though the topic says revamping our safety practices, 
I'll be using the word safety in the very broad sense. So the term safety practices, as it occurs in the subtitle, will be construed to include safety, health, and welfare. So all the things that we will normally deal with under the Safety and Health at Work Act, all the things that we will look at when we mention the term occupational safety and health or safety and health at the workplace, they will be captured within the safety practices and terminology as we use within our subtopic. So all practices, protocols, programs, and initiatives towards safety, health, and welfare. Now, I trust that many of you were able to peruse the documents which were put out by the International Labour Organization, the ILO, because as usual, they sent out uh, various flyers and guidance documents and a nice long 134-page document are relating to the topic um, for this 2021 World Day. And because of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the entire world, uh, rightfully so, their documents focus a lot on um, the COVID-19 pandemic, but in general, infectious diseases and preventing um, those things. So the focus was on workers and people in the world of work as they have been at risk of infection, mainly from this virus. And some workplaces have become sources of outbreaks of the virus. And certain work settings are at particular risk. For instance, where workers are naturally in close contact, like in um, call centers and so on, or in some factory environments and other enclosures where there's poor ventilation. So the ILO has made that particular observation and they have made that the focus of their particular um, trust for the 2021 World Day. They went on to indicate that some occupational safety health risks um, will be acquiring the novel virus. And many persons are not worried about this novel or this new coronavirus, COVID-19. And other risks that um, have emerged due to the workplace practices and procedures include physical, chemical, biological, ergonomic, psychological risks, mental health, violence, and harassment issues. So I share this because, yes, the um, ILO has rightfully placed lots of focus on infectious diseases and principally on COVID-19. But we are going to move our um, conversation, uh, not focusing strictly on COVID-19, but on some of those physical, chemical, biological, ergonomic, psychological, and so on. We are going to look at some of those other risks because we have to be very careful that we do not allow the COVID-19 pandemic and all the hype around that, rightfully so, and the concern and the issues and so on, to cloud our vision and then we drop our guard in other areas. You can be protecting someone from um, not being exposed to the COVID virus, have them wearing their masks or washing their hands, and then the person pushes their hand in the machine and lose all their fingers or fall off of a, a height and get injured. So we have to recognize that uh, when we are looking at our businesses, Though the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is very much with us and rightfully is taking precedence in a lot of our conversation, we are not to do this to the neglect of the other hazards that are traditional and which can impact on business continuity. So then let us look first and foremost at the term business continuity, because if you want to be revamping our safety practices to ensure business continuity, then we need to understand really what is this business continuity? And I'm going to share some traditional definitions. One says that business continuity is the ability of a company to maintain its existence and to recover in the aftermath of any serious or significant organizational, physical, social, environmental business interruption. So we have business interruption, something that was totally unplanned comes along, it dramatically and seriously impacts the business and interrupts its normal operations. And that may be an organizational issue, physical structural issue, social issue, environmental issue. And very often when persons have been putting emphasis on business continuity, immediately the thoughts go to natural disasters. What happens if we had a storm? What happens if we had a, an earthquake? You know, what, what happens if we had a volcanic eruption? How would our business survive? So that discussion about business continuity has traditionally looked at the ability of a company to maintain its very existence, first of all, and then to get back into its normal operations to recover in the aftermath. Another definition says that business continuity is an organization's ability to maintain essential functions. And here, if I lay that, that term, essential functions during 
and after a disaster has occurred. And the most basic business continuity requirement is to keep essential functions up and running during a disaster and to recover with as little downtime as possible. Another popular and traditional definition of business continuity uh, is that it ensures the recovery from various unpredictable events, such as natural disasters, fires, disease outbreaks, example our COVID-19 pandemic, computer failure, cyber attacks, and other external threats. And I'm deliberately sharing these varied um, versions or definitions because they want us to pick up a trend here. Business continuity may be defined as the, uh, the capacity, uh, sorry, the capability of an organization to continue the delivery of products or services at predefined acceptable levels following a disruptive incident. And then business continuity planning or business continuity and resilience planning is the process of creating systems of prevention and recovery to deal with potential threats to a company. And I will also share some models for business continuity and business continuity management. And I want us to pay special attention to the various components or building blocks in this model. So it is suggesting that business continuity management planning must put some emphasis on your information technology recovery. The whole concept of how you're going to continue existence, business continuity. And if there are um, incident, incidents and emergencies and events and so on, you have to see how are they going to impact on your supply chain. And especially if we are putting emphasis and focusing on the retail sector, how do you get the goods that you want to sell? What happens to your supply chain after that disaster, after that incident, after that emergency? What kind of crisis it will create? So then you have your information technology disaster recovery plan, your ITDR plan. You have your business continuity plan. You have very specific plans for aspects of your business. You must have your supply chain business continuity plan and specific crisis management plans. So this is the proper and correct way and the traditional way to look at business continuity. I notice that IT features very strongly there. And one of the things I recognize when I speak to business owners um, is that very often when, you, when they think about this business continuity, the only plan they have in place is IT because we rely so heavily on our computers now that that is a given. So um, companies will put emphasis on having backups and backing up every day and having a father and a grandfather and having a series of backup um, copies. Some of them will look at having um, backups at their own location and one on another location on the island. Some may even go so far as to have a backup overseas. And all that's very good planning in terms of your IT. But understand that the information, um, your data and the information you can pull from that is only one part of the business continuity. And then what has been very different and unusual about this global pandemic is that all of the backup plans got compromised. Because if your plan was that you had a copy of your critical data in St. Michael and one in St. Lucie, and then another copy in St. Lucia or in Canada or the UK, you, if you had a hurricane in the region, you would expect that one island or maybe a few islands would be impacted. There's no hurricane that, that can hit all, all over the globe at the same time. There's no earthquake that would hit all over the world at the same time. But along came a little virus, this novel called coronavirus. And all of a sudden, all the countries that we work with are impacted simultaneously. And that has really been the major challenge of the corona pan pandemic, because all of the business continuity plans that we had in place began to fail. We said, if we have uh, our backups and we have our su supply chains, we, we are buying things traditionally from China. But if China has a problem, we can buy them from Japan. We buy them from the States normally. But if the States has a problem, we want to bring them out of the UK. But all of a sudden, the UK, China, China, Japan, everyone is impacted simultaneously. And that has been the challenge with these um, business continuity plans. Another model follows the same way. The IT, information technology recovery, business continuity, look at your supply chains, securities um, added inside here, and crisis management. Now, when we look at those models, as well as the definitions that we um, had before, you notice that the full pay is on a few things. 
incident response team. They always will suggest you have a team that can respond after that disaster, after that issue. You look at your property, how to secure that property. And that property could be physical um, equipment and plant. It could be the actual building and structures. It could even be the real estate based on what you're doing, your housing and so on. Emphasis based on recovery time. If there is impact, an impact, how quickly can we be up and running? How can we access our supply chain? What alternative supply chains are available? Do we already have relationships um, established with those supply chains as our backup? Or do we have to start them from scratch? If you are dealing with a manufacturing uh, kind of business, you then ask about production. How can we get our production going? What are our mission critical services? If you're more service oriented or consulting um, into consultancy services, what are the mission critical things? If you're using and relying on external personnel like subcontractors or other service providers, who are the ones that are really critical and essential for your business to get going again versus the others that are peripheral and you can probably deal with them later? So those are all valid questions which are asked. The information technology area, as I said, is always um, highlighted in many persons' business continuity planning. Um, if you have sensitive information, you want to make sure that doesn't get into the wrong hands or is not lost. So again, much emphasis is placed on that. Backing up important business data. Look at security and the integrity of assets and data. And we all know that security, we have the cyber security, but we also have the physical security. Because unfortunately, time and time again, we have seen that following natural disasters, following crises, following fires and so on, there's uh, often a degree of pilferage where persons go into your facility and try to take things that they can't even use on some occasions. So security becomes paramount. You also have to be concerned about your business reputation. If you have an impact, does that mean the end of your business? Does person see you as a business that really can't survive? And what about your contract obligations? Um, some companies may be locked in contract um, obligations and there are certain performance clauses. So if you don't perform, albeit for a natural disaster, your suppliers or your clients may actually invoke those performance clauses and you might find yourself in a further hole because you have to pay penalties for not being able to fulfill your contract. So all of those are very critical aspects of business continuity. So from above, from the above definitions, the charts and the lists, we see that the emphasis could be on a, placed on a few things. The recovery of your systems your data and asset protection, maintaining your essential functions and resumption of products and services as soon as possible after your impact. So that discussion hopefully brought us up to speed as to what do we mean by business continuity and the traditional approach to business continuity, ensuring that the business can survive, that its systems can be uh, maintained and get functional again, that whatever product or service you're offering can get back online or get back um, in the public domain as quickly as possible, and you do not lose your clients, you do not lose your reputation, you do not breach your contractual obligations. And all that's well and good, but sometimes what I find is that in the zeal to deal with all of those aspects of the business continuity, persons forget the actual people. Because you have staff, you have persons who are functionaries within your organization. So if you don't take care of the people, but you have all of these other plans for IT and so on, you will still find yourself in a bad place. And one of the things that the COVID-19 um, pandemic showed up is that regardless of what systems you've got, you still needed to rely on people. So safety and health is about people. And therefore, when we look at this topic of revamping our safety practices, we're looking at revamping to cater to people. So no business continuity plan or business continuity management system is complete, nor can it be successful without considering the people, that part of the human resource, which is so critical for your business and for your business continuity. I have a here a quote from a Mr. Michael Herrera, and he made the point that the human factor in business continuity is one of the most important and also one of the most underlooked keys to success in creating an effective business continuity management program. So it's very interesting, it's the most important, but somehow we tend to overlook it because the hardware items are there in our face. You can see if the building is still standing or not. 
if the plant and the equipment is working or not. You want to back up your data, make sure you have copies of uncopies and so on. You have copies stored remotely and so on. And we put our emphasis on these things and the very persons who have to manage the process, the functionaries within our organization, somehow we tend to overlook them. Maybe there's the feeling that you can always get another person. But as we all know, all of us who are in business know that the persons who you have have um, knowledge of your business and they have the experience and the history of your business and they are indeed some of the most important assets. So now let's move more to the topic of the day or our subtopic, revamping our safety practices. Safety practices refer to the guidelines, procedures, programs, and systems which seek to protect the physical, physiological, and psychological well-being of persons. So I'm looking now at the, at the white person, the physical person, the body, the arms and the legs and so on. The physiological, which speaks to your organs and systems. You want to make sure that all your systems are working properly, you're not developing any particular or specific disease. And the psychological, which speaks to the health of the mind and your thinking, your functioning from that perspective. So when we are talking about safety practices, we're looking at it in that broad context. The overall goal of any health and safety program is to ultimately create a safe working environment and to reduce the risk of accidents, ill health, other injuries, or fatalities on the job. Take a moment, let that sink in. Because if you're going to be revamping our safety practices to ensure business continuity, and marrying that with the idea that the people, the human resource is the most critical, then really what we are revamping is um, our systems and our activities in order to prevent accidents in order to prevent persons from having work-related ill health, in order to prevent occupational diseases or any other kind of injury, including emotional and mental injuries, the psychological and even psychiatric injuries. And definitely you don't want your, your asset, your people dying on the job or as a result of the job. So this is really the goal of what we're looking at, critical to business continuity, because all the physical buildings, all the equipment, all the backup of your software, and your data um, will come to naught if the key persons and the critical persons are not able to function because they've been um, killed, they've been involved in accidents that physically injured them, or they have developed work related ill health and occupational diseases. Occupational health and safety also protects the health of customers and the general public, as well as anyone else who may be affected by the particular workplace activities. So this is again taking it fairly um, wide because um, though we look at the employer-employee relationship, we all know that within our various legislations and certainly within the Safety Health at Work Act of Barbados, that it also speaks to anyone else who could be impacted by the activities of the organization, which often means clients, customers, service providers, members in the community and the wider general public. So we have to take this into consideration when we are revamping our business continuity. The recent global pandemic, together with the availability of varied technologies, have fast tracked our need to radically rethink, radically reshape, radically reorganize, and radically respond. In other words, the pandemic and the technology is forcing us to revamp and revamp our safety practices. We were the first several discussions about the changes that were made through the um, 60 COVID-19 impacted Barbados and indeed the region and the way the world. And many times we were hearing conversation to the effect that companies had plans. They had planned to go online. They had planned to offer a particular service, but all of a sudden they had to jump in and test the system immediately. And because with the COVID coming around, they did not have time to gradually move into that position. You had to test the system one time. So you either sink or swim. So this is really what has happened to us, that we are being forced to revamp and we are being forced to rethink and reshape and reorganize and to respond because of the quickness of what has happened. But then on the good side of it is that technology was available because had this um, sort of scenario played out 20, 30 years ago, then many companies still have heavily manual systems, then the ability to be able to respond 
and to reshape and to revamp on short notice will not have been there. So we have to recognize that as we are thinking, we have to look at the external impacts and challenges like um, global pandemics, like disaster, natural disasters, like sabotage, like cyber attacks, but also um, recognize that the technology, whatever technology you're using is part of the solution. And therefore, as we are revamping in the future, including looking at our people, we have to be thinking also about the technology and technologies which they use, and how we're going to utilize this to the best effect. I want to suggest, therefore, that if we are serious about revamping our safety practices, then one of the critical things we have to revamp is our perception and our definition. What is work? The recent events of the COVID-19 forced persons to look at what is work. And similarly, what is the workplace? So if we maintain and try to hold on to the old definition of work and the old definition of workplace, then we're going to find ourselves challenged and we can't revamp. We have a similar thing happening even in terms of the definition of learning and learning institutions. We see it happening in our universities, see it happening in schools even at the moment, and there, there are lots of calls that we get back into school. Because in some person's mind, when you are learning on the computer, then you're not really at school. Now, granted, what has happened is that we were thrown in at the deep end. So schools had to move very quickly from a classroom setting where we had a teacher in control of 10, 20, 30, 40 students and interfacing with them. And all of a sudden, the teacher is somewhere remote and being seen by 10, 20, 30, 40 screens. So that change was very shift. It was very quickly, sorry. That shift was very quickly. But if you think about it, for years, many international universities have actually been offering online programs. And some of those programs are, you go at your own pace, and the others where there are set times and you go and interface with the lecturer, the professor, and so on. So the whole concept of being able to deliver an entire course, not even um, just a primary and a secondary course, but university first degrees and masters and postdocs and doctors and so on. Being able to do that online has been around for quite a while. But what has happened in the recent time is that we were thrown in quickly and it showed up that we do not have the systems in place. So similarly, when we look at our businesses and we look at revamping and we want to ensure business continuity, we have to look at what is work because if for us, work is that the person must come in and sit at the desk and write something on a sheet of paper, then we will always have a problem for our business continuity because we will always be fighting to get the person back in. And our idea of recovery and business continuity will be rebuilding the place, opening back the door, and having the person come and sit on the desk. And then in that kind of thinking, the workplace is the physical place, that warehouse, that retail shop, that office. So if we are to seriously move forward and to be prepared for business continuity 21st century and going forward, our understanding of work and our understanding of workplace first must shift. So the emphasis for work must be more on being able to safely, safely generate the required output, whatever that output may be, as well as to provide quality of service rather than on the details of the process. So what I'm saying here is that if you look and focus on what is being delivered rather than where it's being delivered and how it is being delivered. Once it's being done safely and the quality of product or the quality of service is being maintained, then that is really the work being done and where if it's being done becomes that new workplace. And we have a good example of that um, at a global level in Amazon. Um, many of us would have heard the story that Amazon started as a very small business at somebody's home. But what it did was to have a very big internet presence. So when you go um, on a website and you see a nice website design and you have the ability to talk to items and so on, you have no idea who is at the other end, whether it's a person's bedroom or garage, whether the person actually has a stock in that garage or that warehouse or they have to settle it from someplace. All you are concerned about is that when you make your selection, you get the correct item, you get it at the um, guaranteed price and you get it within a timely manner. So the same thing must um, happen to us in our understanding of work, because work simply just can't be that you are at that place. Now, obviously, there are some um, 
kinds of businesses that must have a physical place. For instance, if you're manufacturing, if you have the equipment to manufacture parts and equipment or doors and windows, um, you cannot give each worker one of the machines to their home. So there will be some aspects of work that you will always have to um, have a physical place. But having done that particular aspect of it, are there other aspects that can be done remotely? What is work? Because at the end of the day, it has to be put, have your output, your product or your service, maintaining your quality, satisfying your clientele. And that is the emphasis rather than simply looking at the place. And I have an example here, um, as I've seen with insurance companies. We all know that traditionally, if you had a home insurance or vehicle insurance, you make your payment. Um, for vehicles, you may get a cover note, and then sometime you will get the actual insurance certificate. And that was usually uh, sent to you, or you went to collect it. It was a piece of paper, nicely folded, often in the case, and that was your official certificate. So if that was your output, if that was your understanding of work and product and service, and the place where that certificate was being generated was your understanding of the workplace, then when you are looking at business recovery and business continuity, you are thinking, how quickly can we get persons back into this place? How quickly can we get our uh, computer and our printer back up? How quickly can we get um, other copies of the uh, certificate paper? Whatever things we use, so that we can provide our print of this piece of paper in the hand, which constitutes a certificate. But I'm sure some of you would have encountered now that many of our um, insurance companies did not want you to come into their premises. Along came COVID, and then you were personal non gratis. No, we don't want you to come and breathe and cough in our workplace. Stay at the door, send us your information. So all of a sudden, persons now were being invited to send in the information online make the bank payments through the payments by direct bank, bank transfer, and the companies are sending electronic um, copies of the certificate, and that now becomes the official certificate. A few months ago, if you got an uh, electronic version that was entering, that was not being accepted, even with NR a wider system, because these things can only happen if the enforcement agencies and so on, the governmental agencies also accept the final product. So you see, we, we're all forced to make a change, and then now we can produce our final output in a different place and in a different format. And the certificate in the PDF format being official, still having on the, the uh, stamps and markings of the, of the company, is a good example of how the, the work and the output has changed. And that still constitutes business continuity. So when we are now looking at recovering from disasters, fires, floods, earthquakes, and all these things, the recovery does not necessarily mean getting back to the piece of paper, getting back to the piece of equipment, but really functional. What, how can we get acceptable quality output or deliver quality service and keep our clientele happy and be profitable? And that is what constitutes business continuity. And this is why I say the first thing we have to revamp is our thinking as to the concept of work and the concept of workplace. So the workplace now has to be extended. And again, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic fast track that, where individuals now are working from home. Now, traditionally, we had the concept of home workers. And a lot of this used to happen in the kind of factory environment. I can recall years and years ago in the Harbor Industrial Estate, we used to have many of these garment manufacturing um, companies. And some of you who are on the right side of 40 you remember smoking. So persons will go there and they will collect this tray and little piece of cloth and they will do smoking and they will take it home and work and bring it back. So they were a form of um, contract work, but they were also referred to as home workers. Or some is what will happen is that persons who were originally employed in a given factory, but then allowed to uh, start working from home and simply submit what they want. So that kind of home working is our traditional understanding of it. But then with the pandemic, um, which causes us to look at crisis and recovery and being able to continue uh, wherever we are, um, cause persons in the non-traditional sense uh, of home workers to start working from home. So these persons were in some cases being asked to use their own facilities. So they took home whatever information or whatever work they had to do and use their own computer and use their own study or bedroom or chair or table, living room table, whatever. In other cases, Companies allowed um, the staff to take home, um, let's say, desks, sometimes computing equipment, sometimes chairs and other furnishings, so that they have moved part of their, their work um, equipment and workstation to their physical home. 
So we have this uh, idea of um, the workplace being extended because you are still expecting that whatever information and equipment and so on that you take to your home, you treat it as the company's property and the company's assets, but you're just doing it at your home. And the duty of care, and I know the Labor Department has been very keen to, to let employers understand this, that the duty of care to the workers still exists, even though they are performing the tasks from the individual home. So that is a very strong point in making the case that the workplace actually has extended. The recognition is there that the workplace has extended from the four walls, which were owned by or managed by the particular company or establishment, to now the, the four walls of that particular individual. And therefore, the duty of care is still expected as far as reasonably practicable. So you still have to provide a safe place and a safe system and safe tools. And this is part of why um, some companies allow the staff to take home various furnishings and equipment because the individual may not have had proper furnishings there. A classic example of that would be in relation to computing equipment. Um, many workers who will argue and insist on having quote unquote ergonomic furniture at home, sorry, at work, and they can't function and they will even strike or call the union because the, the furnishings at work are not ergonomic, they're not suitable. When you go to their homes, they don't have such furniture. But on the same uh, side of it, Neither would they spend eight hours sitting in the furniture at home, or not often. But even if they did, that's their particular decision. But in terms of, of companies being able to ensure the safety of workers and the health of workers, as well as to make them comfortable that they can produce quality work, then some companies allow staff to take home some of the desks, some of the actual chairs, the company equipment, and all other things. So when you are supplying these things to the individual to use at the home, then you're trying to make sure that the place that they're working and the furnishings and equipment in which they're, they're functioning are as safe as reasonably practicable. And of course, the idea of supervision will change because we are not expecting to send a supervisor to the individual's home, but by regularly checking in and giving guidance and following up and getting feedback is, what is now another way of giving um, supervision. So again, as a, we are revamping, to ensure business continuity, we are again revamping our thinking, our thinking on a definition of what constitutes work, what constitutes the workplace, and what constitutes supervision. So I hope we are understanding and getting the point that the real revamping has to start with our mental faculties, it must start with our mental attitude, it must start with our perceptions. If you try to hold on to the traditional brick and mortar, understanding of workplace and work, then we cannot function going forward. And certainly we are not setting ourselves up for proper business continuity because business continuity does not mean getting back up and doing the same thing the same way. It means being able to provide the same or better quality and service, sometimes under different circumstances, different arrangements. The emphasis must be on the output and on the service and not on the place and on the method. That's the way to revamp your thinking to ensure that we have business continuity. And then all of that, we keep saying that people are paramount. So whenever you look at your safety, health, and welfare arrangements, it must be to cater those persons so that they can keep the business alive and that they can provide the quality service and product which you are expecting. That is truly revamping safety practices to ensure business continuity. Now, other aspects that you may want to put some emphasis on would be just the physical objects and structures. Even if you are um, looking at your workplace, your physical place of operation, again, I have recognized over the years a little disparity in emphasis because when persons traditionally thought about business continuity, they were thinking, okay, can this business, can this, these four walls, can this warehouse, can this store, can this office retain, um, sorry, survive some sort of impact, some external challenge, like an earthquake, like a hurricane, um, like volcanic impacts and so on. So if we put our emphasis on those physical structures, we consider the strength and integrity of the structure to withstand the disaster and the external shock. But we also have to think about the people. So if you are, revamping your ideas and your thinking to ensure safety, then not only must be the building and the structure be strong enough to remain standing, but you also have to think about safe heavens, um, safe havens for staff if they have 
going to be in the structure. Now, what do I mean by that? I do know that some international agencies actually um, put up buildings and they have certain aspects of the building reinforced. And the staff is thought that if there's an earthquake, for instance, you can go to this particular room or stand in this particular corridor because this corridor is actually reinforced and is less likely to fall. That is why I talk about the safe heavens. You know that there is some part of the building. And I challenge you to think now about your building. Can you think about your workplace, your ministry, your office, your store, your warehouse? Is there some place in there that if we had another earth tremor, you notice we're getting them in recent years, getting them more often. If we had a really violent earth tremor, instead of telling persons to drop and go under the desk, is there some place in your work, your working environment, where you can say that you can go to this structure because this has been actually built and specially reinforced to be able to withstand um, uh, under threat of certain magnitude. Think about that. Do you actually have such a place in your workplace? So if you're thinking about protecting your persons, when you're building your physical structure, building the steel and all these support structures to ensure the building doesn't collapse, you also have to think about how can um, you protect our people. Where inside of that structure is um, a safe haven for persons? If you haven't done that, then you haven't really revamped your safety practices. You're only looking at the structure and the physical part. You're not looking at the people, the human resource. Another aspect we have to look at in terms of planning our safety practices for business continuity, with the emphasis on the people, is looking at egress. Now, again, traditionally, we talk about egress in the event of a fire. Uh, my experience has been that most, most times you start to have a discussion about disaster and emergency planning, it very quickly goes to fire. Because in the minds of many employers, the only emergency you're going to have is a fire. So if you think of our workplaces, if you think on a national level, what do we have in place for tsunamis? Have we ever had a national tsunami drill? Many individual companies have fire drills. I've heard many calls on radio programs and maybe you can have a national drill if you had a bad fire in town. And how quickly you'll get out. But have we had a tsunami drill? What happens if we have had a few ephemeris and so on? Do we have do we now go into ephemeral drills or fire drills? So we have to start thinking about these things. And from inspecting several, several buildings and premises over my 31 plus years in health and safety, I recognize that many buildings are set up like little mazes. There are so many corridors and little turns and twists and doors and so on that I sometimes ask managers or workers, can you get out of this building if you were blindfolded? So when we are looking at safety practices to ensure business continuity and recognizing that a significant part of the continuity of a business is that human resource preserving the people who have the knowledge, the skills, and the history of our companies, then we have to make sure they can get out of the building of life. There's no point the physical structure being left intact but a few persons got, uh, in, uh, got killed or injured because they couldn't get out. In the case of a fire, for instance, they may die from smoke inhalation um, because the smoke got through and may not, the fire may be brought under control so the physical building did not burn flat. And then the persons die because they inhaled um, some smoke simply because they couldn't get out. This maze. So we have to start looking at those kinds of things. How are, is our building arranged? Where does it lead to? And so on, if we are looking at preserving our human resource to ensure the continuity of our businesses. So, COVID 19 has highlighted the need to utilize building materials and finishes which can be more easily accessed, more easily cleaned, more easily disinfected, and or more easily placed. All of a sudden, with this risk of being impacted by a virus, an invisible enemy, we have to rely on protocols. We hear the Prime Minister talk about those protocols, we hear the Ministry of Health talk about them, we're pissed talk about them, follow the protocols. One of those protocols is to wear a mask. And one of the big ones is the hand washing and the sanitizing. So if you're going to be sanitizing services because of the possibility of them being contaminated by a pathogenic um, organism, in this case, the COVID-19 virus, how easy is it to access that service, first of all? Now, if you're talking about a doorknob, easy to access. If you're talking about your air-conditioned ducting, then how easy is it for you to even get up there to do that? Because if there is a concern that contaminated air has been drafted through your ductwork, how can you even access it? 
if you can assess it, or if you have a strategy that missed in, for instance, how easy is it to clean? If your duck work, for instance, in your offices or your businesses, um, is the older kind, the fibrous um, layers, the fiberboard as we call it. When this gets on that, or if um, pathogens, disease caused organisms get on that, they will be trapped because it's fibrous and it tends to hold things. So how easy is it to clean? As opposed to if you had duct work, which was sort of um, galvanized, which is a hard surface. So we found that challenge come that where persons had issues trying to clean things. And then your finishes. If you have fabric dividers, for instance, in an office, it is more difficult to try to clean those than if you had a hard, impervious surface. Even the whole idea of having um, organisms being able to be clean on the surface, you all would know and expect that a soft, porous surface will form a better harbor for microorganisms and pathogens than a hard, impervious surface. So all of these things have been highlighted when we try to clean and when we try to respond to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So what I'm suggesting is that we use this as a trigger to help us to revamp our thinking. The virus is one consideration, but when we think of the other aspects of our workplace, how are the building materials going to impact our ability to safely provide for our staff? How can we ensure the safety, health, and welfare of our staff with the current building materials, the current finishes and coatings and so on? So we may have to revamp and relook at what we have been doing traditionally and going forward when we do new buildings or we do renovations and upgrades and so on not only choose things based on aesthetics and longevity, but also the ability to clean these things and that these particular finishes, materials, and so on will form safe environments at work to ensure the safety, health, and welfare of staff and the overall continuity of our businesses. Many persons had challenges trying to clean door handles and furnishings, tools and equipment, especially things that have been shared, um, surface coverings, and the air condition that we work on to this, as I mentioned previously. As we're looking at our safety practices and our physical um, aspects, we can also look at physical agents. Previously, we looked at the physical structures, the objects and structures. We also use the word physical to mean energies, agents, things like vibration and noise and so on. And I especially want to highlight the whole question of radiation, because um, there's been lots of talk about exposure to non ionizing radiation a form of radiations that will come off of computer equipment and cell phones and other communication devices. And as we were going through this business recovery and persons were working more and more from home, they were relying more and more on phones, especially mobile phones. So many companies were not too keen on installing a landline in someone's home, but they would very quickly issue them with a mobile device. And I've been hearing and encountering persons who are telling me, oh, we're having a webinar or a teleconference on the phone for an hour, two hours, three hours. What is the impact on the individual having a phone to their head or in close proximity for two or three hours straight or taking a break and then continuing? What is the impact on that, of that radiation? Even when you choose the phone, did you buy the phone based on its features or did you ask a question about the level of radiation and the level of um, coverage it does give. You know, you have to look at those things. They say well insulated that it does not send out a lot of radiation. So we have to start thinking about those things. That's part of our safety practices. That's part of revamping our thinking if we are going to put our emphasis on our staff and on our people and that human resource. So even those physical agents we have to look at. Then of course, the physiological. Physiology speaks to the organs and systems of your body. You want to make sure that your liver is functioning and your liver system is working. Your blood system is working, your renal system is working, and so on. How will the various chemicals and biological agents which you, you use and introduce into your workplace impact on your staff? So again, if you want to be revamping to ensure safe practices and the safety, health, and welfare of our staff, they in our choosing and issuing of these substances, or in terms of the existence or even utilization of biological entities within our workplace. We have to make sure that there are not things that are going to cause chronic impacts. Now, I'm putting my emphasis on the chronic impacts more so than the acute, the long term rather than the immediate and short term, because we tend to respond to anything that is short term. If you use a chemical and you get a headache, you know immediately you make a complaint, you make a change. But what happens with the chemical that does not give you a headache, but is actually causing you to develop some form of cancer? So, you don't have the warning signs 
and therefore you can be exposed. And it's feeling is that it's safe because you're not feeling anything. But if a company wants to look at business continuity, as I keep saying, there's no point making sure that your building is still standing and that your data is backed up. But then the very individuals who have got the skills, the knowledge, and the history of your company are being impacted adversely because you are not taking care of them. You're not planning in the long term to prevent those chronic uh, diseases and health effects. So our revamping has to be beyond simply looking at preventing the fire and making sure the building is standing and the equipment is in place, you know, this is backed up, but taking care of people. I'm suggesting to you that the taking care of the individual, taking care of your staff, in the taking care of your human resource is extremely critical for business continuity, not simply backing up data and keeping the plant alive. So the chemicals that you use, uh, um, you choose, as well as making sure that you don't have the transmission and spread of pathogens, those disease-causing organisms within your environment, all part of your revamping and your planning for continuity of your business. In the physiological, you can also look at the impacts on the muscles and joints of the body, which is often the focus of ergonomics. So be very prudent in matching your tools, your equipment, your furnishings, and your system of work, the methods you do things, the physical and mental attributes of your personnel. Again, if you go the tradition of simply buying equipment from a catalog based on what it can do, the availability of parts to service it, and how long it's supposed to last, you do not look at the individuals who are going to be using it. Are these big persons or small persons, young persons, older persons, um, males versus females? If you don't look at the individuals who are using these things, then the furnishings and the tools and equipment which you provide may be, in theory, very good and suitable for your process, but it, they are putting on due stress and pressures on the individuals, bodies and joints and muscles and ligaments and tendons and everything else. So you're literally wearing the persons out as you're getting your work done. And that obviously cannot argue well for business continuity because as the person grows in the business and grows with the business and become more skilled, more knowledgeable, has more history, more ideas, at the very time when you want to be using them, the persons now are being relegated to home or even the workplace because they are being damaged. They are being, all of the poor ergonomics are now showing up in the hands and the joints and the back and neck and shoulder and whatever. And these individuals now are not much use to themselves at home or to the company because you do not have good safety practices that look at the individual and at the people to ensure that they too were being part of your continuity. So you want to control the tempo of work to reduce musculoskeletal impact and to even look at the physical demand. Now, um, I have not seen a wide practice in Barbados of doing physical demand analysis. I have traveled a bit and I've seen in some countries where advertisements are placed in paper, in the newspaper or other places for individuals. And as is done in Barbados, the ad will indicate the kind of um, qualifications the person might have the preferred number of years of experience, the sort of skill sets. But then they also go on to say, what is the physical demand? This person is expected to lift 20 pounds. This person is expected to sit continuously for several hours, must be able to walk or to climb. And they will mention the physical demand. So maybe we need to revamp our thinking so that for all of our jobs, we look at the physical demand. What is this doing to the person? And don't make the assumption, oh, this is a sitting job. And because the sitting job is an easy job, a sitting job may actually be more demanding than a job that is really active and physical. You may have a person who is involved in lifting, the lifting part of them, loading or whatever, and you pass and they're expecting, so oh, that's a very demanding job. And you walk past and they see a secretary or receptionist sitting there talking to the phone. And then five years on, who develops back problems? The same person who was sitting using the telephone. Because the one who was lifting may have been taught in manual handling, and that person may have learned some technique, how to protect themselves, and they know their own limits and don't lift too much. But the other person who is sitting doesn't have good back support, doesn't have good lumbar support, they may sit in a bad, a bad posture, and then over time, they develop all sorts of issues, complex and complex this, and all sorts of issues in the lower back simply from sitting, because we have not looked at the physical demand of a process or an activity of simply sitting. So that goes for everything, whatever a person is being required to do in your workplace be it a very active or 
Second job, you have to do a physical demand analysis. And this I'm suggesting part of revamping our thinking and revamping our safety practices to ensure the basis can continue. Very, very critical. And then the psychological aspect. In recent years, mental health has been given a lot more attention. Thankfully, I know that many persons have been pushing this forward. Uh, you can think of our good old brother Gabby Scott, or Lander Gabby Scott, for many, many years. He's been trying to push the mental health agenda and sometimes to no avail. But at least he's been in the life to see that his efforts have worn fruit. And even at the level of the ILO, they've been um, highlighting the whole question of mental health. So again, when you have all your plans in place to ensure that your building will remain standing and your debt is backed up, then come back to your people. How is this job impacting persons mentally and emotionally? What's happening psychologically to these persons? What's happening emotionally on these persons? Do you even have a mental health policy? And for the persons, the participants here, I tend to think about that. Does your company have a mental health policy? Do you design work to make sure that person is not burnt out? Interesting enough, with this pandemic and persons working from home, the feedback I'm getting from many persons that they're actually working harder than when they're at work. They want to go back to work because at least for three they get about and leave the place. But they find themselves you know, working in the day, working at night. And this is also being, in some cases, being fueled by management. Because 10 o'clock in the night, um, someone sends a, a message um, by email and expect an answer. And if they don't get an answer, in 15 minutes, they call the person on the cell phone and ask, have you seen the message we sent you? They may have an answer. So if managers uh, are going to do this kind of thing for employers, you send a message day after hours, you know the person will not have been at work at 10 o'clock before. But then you send a message at 10 o'clock and I expect a message at the last thing. And then even go the extra step to call the person at home, disturb their family life to get an answer. No one the person to burn out. So in the workplace, the physical workplace, you have to have systems in place for work rest regime. But even if the person is working at home, you have to make sure that you respect that. Encourage them to say, therefore, work life balance for those persons who are working from at home. You don't shouldn't be part of the problem. You should actually be encouraging them to take that break. Avoid creating high stress situations. Too often things escalate unnecessarily, and therefore persons are stressed out and have all sorts of mental health challenges. And then you want to facilitate persons with things like employee assistance program. Um, I'm happy to say that over the, the years, especially in the last 10 years, I've seen many more companies having this um, process in place or this facility in place of employee assistance programs. That's a positive step, and it is a recognition of the whole question of mental health and stress and so on. So I certainly congratulate and applaud the many companies, including the public service, which have made this available. It's a step in the right direction. And again, anything you do to preserve your individual, to preserve, to preserve your personal, your, your human resource, is in fact a step towards preserving your business and being able to recover if there's an external impact. Continue on the mental health um, aspect of it. Things like anxiety produced by health risks. Um, lots of persons have been all stressed out with the coronavirus. And there have been many programs on television and radio and so on. We had various health professionals talking about individuals who are um, not coping that well, well at home and in family because they are all stressed out with the COVID uh, situation. Some are just stressed out whether they're going to get it or not, but that in itself becomes a problem. They become uh, very paranoid that everyone who comes to close them is going to pass on the virus. But beyond that, the impact of things that work. If persons have been laid off for a long time, they're not sure when the business will reopen, the business itself is not sure when it's going to reopen, and they have the obligations, their mortgage, the children to take care of the um, food to buy and whatever. So that is a stress off. So when we have this um, crisis, this health crisis going on so long, that has been impacting our mental health. And it's pretty easy for an employer to say, well, this is actually a national issue not a workplace issue and therefore don't offer the necessary support. I'm suggesting that you, you still want to offer the support to your, your staff because they are part of your business, they are part of your continuity if and when things are resolved and get functioned again. So we have to take those into consideration. So the psychological impact and the stress that persons have gone because of the radical changes in the work organization and the work processes and conditions, um, that happened so quickly because of the this this disaster, really, the COVID-19. This is now a health disaster 
It wasn't a fire, it wasn't an earthquake, but it was still, it still had a, a catastrophic impact on many businesses. So that rapid change has also weighed heavily on some persons' overall emotional and mental well being. So I've put some emphasis on what companies and managers and employers can do as they look at making sure the businesses can continue and recognizing that it's not simply about plant and equipment, but very, very critical about human resource. The people who use the plant the equipment, people who have, have the history and the knowledge and skill of your business, they must be preserved. They must be part of your long-term planning if your business must, is going to be in a position to be able to continue and to recover. And finally, at the governmental level, we all know that the tripartite approach is used and very, very respected in Barbados, but we thought that, and that government has a part to play, the employer has a part to play, and the employees, and the employer and the employees may have their representation through various unions and other bodies. So government also has to set that particular framework at the national level in making sure that the regulations and the legislative instruments are in place. That's the first thing, they must give the framework because companies and individuals need the guidance and some need enforcement. So they must have the, the regulatory uh, framework in place. It's very popular for persons to ask, what does the law require? What is it supposed to do? And when you look at the um, presentations for the World Day for Safety and Health, you notice that the um, ILO would have given summaries of many of its conventions and recommendations so that those themselves are there to give guidance to governments so they can set the regulatory framework. And then having put the regulations and the legislation and directives, everything else in place, you must give some guidance in terms of understanding and interpreting, as well as oversight, because if you don't give oversight, nothing will happen. And I think if there is a problem we have um, as a society in Barbados, it is that we have many, many laws which are not enforced. Um, somehow it seems as if the making of a law, passing of a law, uh, uh, some lesser instrument is seen as an end in itself. And what a profit that is not an end, that's the beginning. Putting the law is only the beginning because the real value of the law is oversight and enforcement. If there's no oversight and enforcement, it's simply some writing on a piece of paper. Some persons will try to um, follow it, some will actually do, many will even understand it. Most don't even know how to access it. So really the strength uh, in setting that framework is in making laws, making directives, giving orders, having regulations, having that legislative framework in place. But then they must be given guidance, giving guidance, oversight, and enforcement, ensuring enforcement in order to complete the picture. If that is not done, then truly governments can't say that they've done their part. The Government is also um, the holder of lots and lots of data. There are many government agencies that collect data on workplaces and on workers. So if we can get them um, involved in more in-depth data analysis and information management, then that again will give um, employers better position, a better position in which they can make their decisions uh, in terms of revamping their safety practices and ensuring the safety of their workers and ultimately longevity and business continuity. So what happens to that data? We know that there's a lot of data collected over the years. Um, and please to say that in recent times, more and more of that has been analyzed and being made available to the um, public. But there's still, there's still a lot of things, a um, lot of statistics, a lot of data that we don't have. And therefore, too often in for like this one, um, persons will resort to giving statistics and figures out of the um, developed countries simply because there's a dearth locally and even regionally. When the information is there, it must also be shared. Um, it's not going to be much help for employers and the wider public if you're going to simply have government agencies have information that's being used internally and no one's guessing. So you have to extend the social dialogue to include the non traditional parties. And finally, government must articulate a national policy. Again, the ILO's convention speak about having a national policy on safety health, and it's saying that we have such a national policy. In our safety health work act, there's a requirement that companies or employers have a workplace policy. It's interesting that we're asking worker, I mean, employers and companies and occupiers to have a policy at the workplace, but we have not articulated a policy at a national level. 
as required under the under the ILO Convention. So we need to move towards that and implement a national occupational health and safety management system. Again, many companies have workplace health and safety management systems. You recall a few years ago, many persons were going for the eight, the OSAF 80,000 management system. And more recently, they're looking at the ISO 43001 management system. ILO itself has done up various management systems, the Candle Check and Act. The Labor Department does, in fact, um, but don't want a self management system. So we need to also have a national health and safety management system articulated. So those are two critical things at the government level a national policy and a national management system. I thank you for listening, and I, I would love to turn you back over to the moderator and I'll be available for questions. Thank you. And I thank you too, sir, um, for your, your presentation. I think um, you have guided us in the right way. Uh, we will now go into our questions and answers segment. Um, one of the, you can hear me? Yes, please. Okay. Every. Um, we have a lot of questions. I hope we, we get the time to go through it, go through them, you answer them uh, in a timely manner. Uh, one, of the first, one of the first questions um, is what about plans in place for shelters in the COVID environment vis a versa um, the COVID pro protocols? Uh, that, that, that is a question that will probably have to be answered at the governmental level. Um, shelters, in terms of persons who are impacted and who wouldn't, wouldn't be able to work from uh, their home and so on, is something that's something that's been looked at in, in some sense. If you think about it, uh, the government has been, uh, through the Ministry of Health, um, actually taking persons from their home during quarantine periods if the person indicated that they do not have suitable facilities. So they were not like, activating our emergency shelters in that sense because we haven't reached that point, but they were still facilitating um, persons who needed to be quarantined away from home. So you may have heard on the news that in some cases they were using hotels and so on and allowing persons to be away. So that is the sort of um, facility or shelter, if you want to put it that way, um, in terms of, of the COVID. But um, it's not a case where you open a school and bring a whole lot of persons there because you still have to be able to manage these individuals. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that has the kind of shelter, if you want to put it, put it that way, that was a facility, and it actually has been done. Some persons were down at St. Lucy Harrison Point facility, but government actually used um, hotels and other places for quarantining individuals who indicated that it was not safe or uh, feasible to go quarantine at home during times when they were doing, let's say, contact tracing and so on. So that has been done. Um, that's that. I don't know if anyone from the ministry wants to, because that's more governmental position that you have to articulate. All right, other question. Um, how do we incorporate remote work, working from home in the, in the, in the plan? Um, I, I heard you said also that, you know, when you're working from home, you work, something that seems to work longer hours, so mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a fact. Yes, it's a bit of a challenge because First of all, as I would have made the point, not all jobs can easily and completely be done from at home. If you have uh, cases where persons are involved in manufacturing and they're actually using equipment, which is supplies, obviously you can't issue everyone um, for the manufacturing plant, okay? Um, if you have a bakery, you can't give everybody an um, oven to carry home. If you're doing uh, structural work, making structural components, so there are some jobs where you have to look at how to get those persons back in um, in a timely manner. But in the cases where work can be taken away and, done and used remotely, then there must be some discipline. When persons are going to the physical workplace, there's an expectation that they arrive at a certain time, even if there's a flex hour, flex arrangement. In fact, this the person would be required to put in their six hours or eight hours in the previous. Many companies, you know, persons go to work anywhere between seven, and nine, and then they will be coming off anywhere between three and five. So this um, popular eight-hour workday, some people have nine-hour workdays, some have 12-hour workdays, but they, or, there's an expectation that there's a set workday. Person know when they're supposed to start and when they're going to finish. So they have not to be disciplined enough to also do that when they're at home. Now, granted that the being at home coincided with children being at home. So very often, um, persons have to be dealing with online learning during the course of the day, which is not a problem because the whole idea is that you need to be catering. But if you're going to spend three hours with your child on the 
continue doing home learning, that's three hours you're not doing with your, for your employer. You put back in that three hours at some point, but you don't want to that will go from three hours to four hours to five hours at midnight. It's still working at midnight, and they try to get up at six o'clock to get the children. So you have to put in the same yes, but you also have to plan. And one nice way to do it is to at home make a schedule, make your own personal schedule. I'm going to get up at six, I'm going to deal with the family matters until eight, I'm going to work from eight to 10 um, with the company's work, I'm going to do online learning from 10 to 12 or whatever. So you have to make a schedule. So that's my, my suggestion that you make a schedule because if you simply uh, let it drift on, drift on, you don't realize how much time you've put in until you begin to feel really, really burned out. And one easy way to know that you burn out is when you go to sleep and you wake up tired. And that has been the cry a lot of persons, you know, they get up tired, they wake up in the morning tired. Something has to be wrong. Not all of us get eight hours of sleep, and it's not always the length of the sleep, but the quality of sleep. And if you go to sleep with your work on your mind and issues on your mind and so on, you lay in bed, but you're not sleeping. So you would wake up there. So scheduling is very, very critical and being able to plan and get some rest in there. I, I, I had another question uh, where I saw, um, I think you probably will answer that. Uh, what are the limitations and responsibilities of the employers to its employees when working from home? So I guess you have to look at a lot of, lot of, lot of cause one thing leads to the other. So. Yeah, I, I will still make a comment here because that's a very tricky one. Um, I mentioned the concept of the duty of care, which is the common law duty that speaks to the employer having a responsibility or duty to provide a safe place of work, a safe system of work, safe tools and equipment, safe co-workers, and adequate supervision. Now, when you are working from home, you then ask the questions, which of those are applicable and how far can you go? So the safe place would, wouldn't include going and uh, strengthen the person's building or go and change their steps or change their floor services. So you're not expected to go and remake the individual's home. But if you are sending things there, especially the emphasis on tools and equipment, if they're taking home furnishings like desks, like chairs, and they take home any kind of equipment, small piece of manufacturing equipment, they take taking home computer and computing equipment, by any machines or whatever, you have to make sure that those persons are taking pieces of equipment that are safe and safe for use in their home. It might be safe, for instance, under your electrical setting, but not theirs. So you may want to have them um, get the electricity checked, for instance, to make sure that your equipment doesn't cause any problem, cause an overload and burn the house down. And you can either get their permission to send an electrician or ask them to have an electrician in the company and on the bill. There are different options you can do, but you have to show that you've made some effort to verify that whatever tools and equipment they're taking home can be used safely. They are safe as practicable when you issue them and that can, they can be safely used in a given environment. I mentioned supervision. Supervision wouldn't mean sending a supervisor to the person's house, but rather giving them guidance and support and making sure that they have ready and easy access to call and ask a question, to raise concerns and so on. That they don't feel isolated and alone. They're physically at home, but they should still be feel, feeling connected to the company and its personnel. So that's how the supervision part will be done. So the safe place may not be, um, you not be able to correct that fully, but certainly the tools and equipment, um, the supervision and the systems, you give them some guidance. I can share a personal, um, a personal case where, um, as you know, I'm safe, it's safe health consultancy, and there have been several companies that have actually um, asked me to do ergonomic assessments of their staff workstations at home. So what I would do is either get them send me photographs or get their cell phone and turn on the video, and they walk me through their home workstation, and then I will have them sit in it and let someone else hold the camera so I can see how they're interfacing, and they can actually then suggest adjustments and rearrangements of the workstation at home. So this is where a case now where the employer is still fulfilling his or her duty of care. He is still having the workplace assess. Now the person is using um, the equipment at home. So the home has got the workplace, but they still have made a reasonable effort to control and to give guidance in that workplace. So when it comes to liability, then um, how do you assess that? Uh, <laughs> That's always, that's always a tricky one. The thing about liability is that it comes down to responsibility. How much, the question has to be asked, how much of the situation was under the control of the employer and whether or not the, the employer has made a reasonable step. Now, I give the example of the ergonomic assessment. That's a reasonable step. If you have issued someone with furnishings to take home 
You've also taken the steps to make sure that you've given them guidance, maybe even documentation, and even have it assessed. So you have taken your, your, um, your responsibility seriously. If you simply tell the person to take it home and is left to them because they're at home, then you can't really demonstrate that you've tried anything reasonably practicable. But there will always be things that are outside of the control um, of the employer. As I mentioned, like for instance, floor surfaces, you can give guidance on it, but an employer cannot go back and tell an employee, well, because of this particular chair, you have to change your tiles and put a carpet or change the carpet, change, get rid of the rug. You know, there's certain things that they won't be able to do. But uh, within reason, ask questions, give guidance, give information. The legislation always speaks about information, instruction, and training, okay? So you make sure you give those things uh, where it's feasible to do remote assessments, or even if the person would allow um, a visit, you can do that. So those are ways that companies can demonstrate they've taken reasonable steps and therefore minimize liability. One of the major problems that um, companies will, will always face with liability is their failure to show that they've thought and given some sort of um, view on, on an area and they fail to do a risk assessment. So by doing a risk assessment and being able to demonstrate that they have given it some thought and put reasonable steps in place, that will be the way to have to defend themselves. Thanks, because um, it seems like you, um, the questions that I, I'm seeing in front of me, you have answered them already, because the, the next question was to deal with risk assessment, so we don't think we have to go into that. But we have to wrap, we soon have to wrap up. Um, just for the participants, um, there's an evaluation exercise at the end of the webinar, and I need you all to, to, to look at it and fill it out, please. Um, do you want to say something else, Mr. Oxley, or? No, um, I just thank everybody for joining in and the questions and hope that we really take it seriously that business continuity is not just about the plant and, and ensuring that your data is backed up, but most critically that your people are there because people take with them the history of your company, the skills and the knowledge, and they are critical for business continuity. That's my, my final comment. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Um... So we would then thank you. And they will be, the vote of thanks will be coming just shortly, but for me, um, I just want to say thanks for the informative information that you have given. No, I know this, the COVID and now the ash, we haven't looked at the ash, the ash aspect of it, <laughs> of the seminar, because I think this is part of the business continuity to um, going forward. And yeah. it has set us back to in a lot of ways. So um, we will hand you over to one of the officers at the Labor Department to give the floor of thanks. Okay. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for staying the course with us on this webinar. In the words of an African Edenic proverb by the craftsman. How is the best way to find what is wrong? Find out what is right. <laughs> and certainly on behalf of the Ministry of Labor and Social Partnership Relations, our partners, the Small Business Association, the Barbados Employers Confederation, and the Barbados Workers Union, we would like to thank you for participating in today's webinar. We wish to give a special thank you to you, Mr. Oxley, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to unfold the principles of the topic at hand today, revamping our safety practices and looking at business contu continuity in a different way. Thank you so much. Uh, we would also like to thank our partners, the staff and members of the Small Business Association of Barbados, the Barbados Employers Confederation, the Barbados Workers Union, as well as the staff and management of the Ministry of Labor and Social Partnership Relations, as well as the Labor Department. We have to give a special thank you to our technical team, the, the gentlemen, Mr. Paul Mears and Mr. Latsy Husbands, who have been working behind the scenes, 
bank holidays, nighttime, early mornings. We especially thank you, our IT experts, for your contributions. We would also finally wish to thank you, the participants, for joining us to achieve a collective goal. Uh, we trust that you will be able to put in place the principles that you would have received here today. Uh, we will encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube page at the Ministry of Labor Barbados and also follow, continue to follow our website at labor.gov.bb. There were quite a few questions which we didn't get to answer today, but we will try our effort best to perhaps post some of the questions on our website. So my final comment is that we, we thank God for this beautiful day and do enjoy your lunch and have a great afternoon. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks to all persons. Bless Take you. care. Okay. And thank you also.